a new example in Python using Python for machine learning. So in this example we will be uh, going over constructing a neural network model the model uh, or a deep learning model in fact that uses a few layers a few hidden layers and then train it to to produce some uh, like classify some data or predict the labels for the, some data in the form of aggression so in this example we have a data set that we will use as an example for training our model so we are expecting to as i said uh, constructing a regression model in this regression model we will see how to include multiple layers and how to 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 change the neurons or the number of neurons in each layer uh, to tune uh, a few of the hyperparameters for training a model so we'll go uh, over a very high level uh, types of parameters how to tune them and how to find the best values for them uh, then we'll talk about training the model over or using a CPU which is the central processing unit that any computer already have or using what's called GPU GPU stands for graphical processing unit so graphical processing unit you need to have uh, the graphical processing unit installed at your machine uh, or at your computer your laptop you may not have a graphical processing unit on your computer so therefore by default I will run it on a CPU but I will show you if you have a GPU what command you need to use the GPU needs to be or the GPU needs to be uh, of NVIDIA's type and you need to install the drivers and make sure it's up and running if you have any difficulties with the uh, driver please write a comment or send me a message or email and I should be able to guide you how to install and prepare your GPU then we will see how to evaluate the model and what metrics we need to use for evaluating this model and what would be the best uh, evaluations for or it's in fact not the best just some examples and samples of the evaluation metrics that you can use for evaluating uh, a regression model then we will talk finally close by uh, how to save your model weights save them in the form of a binary file that you can use and and uh, transfer for instance in a deployment or environment and put it in production notes all of the code in here uh, runs with tensorflow uh, 2.1.0 uh, and I just remove the CUDA because the code does not require CUDA by default if you need to, use, to run it on a GPU you need CUDA otherwise you want just to make sure that you have tensorflow 2.1.0 and I will show you in a minute how to install it and prepare your environment for this example uh, we are using Boston housing data set the data set is available in here and I will make sure I, I will attach it with the uh, ex with this uh, video we also have it available in some other resources please feel free to download it or from any of these sources or download it from the example that we have the data set includes 13 different attributes they are attributes of houses at different locations around Boston suburbs in the late 1970s the target are the median value of the houses at location and it's in 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 thousand dollars value so the the ultimate goal or the label that we are looking for is the median value of the house so we have a few variables I'll not go into the details of the variables but I added the description of each variable and uh, I just copied and pasted them from the source of the data set and as you see in here med V which is the median value of the owner occupied home it's in one thousand dollars and this is will be this will be our label this will be our target so when if you would like to start with this example you need to make sure that you have scikit-learn already in, uh, sklearn sorry already installed and we already installed sklearn in previous videos so I highly recommend you to use the same uh, environment that we created in previous videos just add the following two packages to this environment you need to pip install tensorflow and pip install git plus HTTPS get so this is just for the documentation of tensorflow and part of the plots documentations so please make sure you install these two packages open the terminal of your environment in anaconda copy the first line and paste it in that command line 
once it's done and it might ask you to install other packages and or it will install them for you by default such as GCC and other C++ compilers if you use a Mac or you use um, uh, Unix or Linux otherwise you should be good to go um, then install the second ones once the first one is done so now let me just zoom in and try to see what we have in here so we will import a few libraries in Python and these libraries that we will use later on for uh, manipulating and processing our data I will refer to them later on during this uh, uh, tutorial or this video and well, just to mention them quickly I tried to add a comment for each library or each package how or why we need it for instance we import OS and OS is, stands for the operating system it's a, a package that includes some uh, uh, some uh, functions to manipulate create delete list the directories create files uh, folders delete folders list the contents of a specific folder and so on so we need this package or this uh, this package for listing the contents of a directory and um, uh, a listing of a directory where we would like to save our model and by the way just to let you know that I downloaded the data and the data is in CSV file it's already saved within the same directory where my data or my model is saved or this file is saved so this is our exercise file and this is the data set that we have it's saved in the form of CSV file and I'm just trying to hide it just to, so we can see the font a bit larger now the second two or the next two lines are two packages or Python libraries they are well-known packages and libraries for creating and constructing a neural network package uh, neural network models uh, you can use them for constructing neural network models simple similar to the one that we cre will create in this video or more complicated such as GAN models or uh, uh, ResNet models or much more complicated neural network models RNN models recurrent neural network models convolutional neural network models or uh, DNN deep neural network models so in this tutorial we'll just take it make it simple and we'll just construct the one simple neural network that uses uh, just very simple neurons for constructing it's called in fact uh, dense or a, a neural network with dense set of layers or uh, fully connected layers so we will use tensorflow we imported tensorflow and we named it as TF and we imported Keras, which is uh, like a package or a library on top of TensorFlow that tries to make TensorFlow easier to use and more and more convenient. So therefore, we will do our best to use Keras, uh, and Keras will come from TensorFlow. But we do need these two uh, packages to be imported. So this is one. The second thing is Keras is already installed on your machine once you install TensorFlow. Now I would like to m emphasize this. Keras comes from with with various flavors. It comes from different libraries, or it it comes on top of different libraries such as TensorFlow, Theano, Torch, and other types or other libraries and packages of machine learning. I want to emphasize in here when you install uh, Keras, do not install Keras per se. Just install TensorFlow, and TensorFlow will install Keras for you. Do not try to install Keras please otherwise you will run into problems and uh, like that will require more investigation try to resolve them on your own now I imported Keras in here and now to uh, divide my data into three splits train test and uh, validation I imported a train test split from sklearn.model selection I will show you also another method where you can um, where you can also uh, split your data without using this package like there is another method that you can use it comes by default with um, uh, Python native to Python and you can use it for splitting your data we will go over it uh, today in this video uh, and then the last uh, step in here I'm trying just to see that I already installed tensorflow and it looks like the tensorflow that I installed in here on, on this machine is 2.3.0 so as you see in here, it's it's a, the, a, like a version uh, different than the version I listed in the requirements for this example. 
let's go back I said it's 2.1.0 at least so therefore I evaluated in fact when I, I developed this example I used 2.1 and now I'm running it on a different machine and I use TensorFlow 2.3 and it ran without any problems so have having 2.1 and above should be fine now this line will print the TensorFlow version for you and it will make sure that you have TensorFlow installed correctly now uh, you can either import the data in the form of uh, a NumPy array or use the uh, pandas or use sorry the CSV file that they included in here if you would like to import or use the Boston housing from TensorFlow feel free to uncomment this line and download it from from this uh, repo or the package that comes with Keras and the data set that comes with Keras for just testing and sample of data set now the following three lines will be importing a few a few um, uh, functions or a few objects that we will use for constructing our neural network so our neural network will have a backbone so the backbone where we uh, try to set and insert add our layers into or our neural network components into this backbone it's called sequential so this sequential we imported sequential from tensorflow.keras.models so this uh, sequential will be the backbone where, where we will be adding all of our uh, neural network components so this will be an empty backbone or container in the following line we are importing multiple layers and components so you see these are imported from the, pa the, the object or the class layers from Keras the first one is activation if you remember we talked about uh, uh, activation functions in the past and some of one of the activation functions that we covered in our class was sigmoid function so we will use either sigmoid function or there are other activation functions that you can use in here uh, feel free to use the sigmoid or any other functions as we will see later on we have uh, sigmoid we have relu we have tan h and other types of activation functions uh, dense so dense in here is uh, the uh, uh, fully connected or linear layer that we will use for constructing our neural network so this example works for a tabular data data in the form of a table so if you have your data in the form of an image or you have audio you have music you have uh, text so most likely this uh, the, 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 this example will not work for you it will work just for uh, tabular data data that comes in the form of a two-dimensional matrix or an array or two-dimensional uh, matrix or two-dimensional table I do have other layers that I imported such as batch normalization and dropout they are out of this class scope uh, I just would like to show you that you have other libraries that you can or other sorry other la layers that you can import from uh, layers of uh, of Keras but we will not use batch normalization we will not talk about it and we will not talk about dropout so the the following cell uh, TensorFlow utility packages they are some, some packages if you remember when we installed uh, TensorFlow at the beginning of this video we used the second uh, installation was for the documentation some sort of documentation for the plots and the modeling information so I just would like to import them in here in case we need to use them uh, we imported pathlib pathlib is for processing the path uh, similar to the path for instance where your data is located or where your files are located we also imported from matplotlib if you remember this matplotlib it's a library for plotting uh, or displaying your data in a graphical representation for example plotting a histogram plotting a bar chart or a pie chart or something like this so we imported from matplotlib we imported by uh, plot as plot and this would be used for creating different types of charts we also imported numpy if we would like to use it or we needed to use the numpy we imported it in case and we imported pandas as pd and we imported seaborn for plotting as well as sns now 
Uh, if you remember when we talked about neural network, we said we can initialize our weights using either zeros or initialize the weights or our parameters. When I say weights, I mean our model parameters or weights. I will refer them to new with uh, within the context of neural network as weights. So we initialize our weights uh, randomly, or we initialize them using uh, zeros or ones for uh, for the sake of this example. And it's a good practice, in fact, to initialize them uh, using a smart random method. We will not talk about the random or the smart random methods for initializing the neural network, and we will leave them by default. Feel free to go and go over them. But when you initialize your model and you run your model on this computer, for instance, and you move it to a different computer or you run it at a different time, this the random values that you use to construct or to initialize your weights will be different each time you run your model. So to make sure that the random values that we use for initializing the weights, they are exactly the same every time I run my model, we use this set seed. So set seed is a function that comes from random and TensorFlow that we use to initialize a seed and this seed if we keep using the seed so if I give you this code that I constructed in here and you use the same seed I used in here as 13 then you will be able to get the same results similar to what I got for this model or fairly close so this number can be any integer value I just put it 13 and you can put it as an any integer value and it's worth it to mention that uh, TensorFlow is developed by Google and you should be able to find a lot of documentation about TensorFlow and Keras on the internet so feel free to refer to the internet if you have any questions or you have you need more to expand your knowledge in neural network and how to use Keras and TensorFlow and again at any time feel free to contact me if you have any questions or any comment we have debugging in here. We set the debugging or set log device placement as false, so we do not see a lot of debugging or a lot of log uh, text. So I set it to false. Um, if you would like to use a GPU, you can uncomment the highlighted light. So GPU again stands for graphical processing unit. If your machine is equipped with GPU, you can uncomment this line, and this will make sure the GPU on your machine is available for you within this program and you can use it to run your code. Now I, I, I commented this out because I do not have a GPU on this computer and uh, if you would like to use a GPU you may want to install a different TensorFlow version. It's called TensorFlow-GPU. We will keep it simple and we will not use a GPU for, um, for the sake of this example. The only thing that you need to change within this if you want to run this example on GPU is installing the drivers of, of uh, TensorFlow of sorry of the uh, GPU make sure you have CUDA and CUDA NN they are packages and libraries to make sure that your GPU is running in parallel and utilized as it should be then uncomment this line and we will see a few other lines that you can uncomment them to run your program on a GPU and the speed will be much much faster so the, the training of the model will be much faster so for instance, instead of training for three hours, it will train in like, maybe 15 minutes or something like this. This example will not require that much of time of training. However, I will not train the model right now because I want to use the advantage of time and I do not want to spend like like three, three, four minutes waiting until the, uh, the model runs. So I already run everything for you and it's up and running and I might be, I might run, for instance, a model for you just to show you how you can run it and and uh, uh, like uh, how you can run it and how much time it will take to train. The, the next step in here in cell 13, I loaded all of my data. So the data that I have is saved in the, in the Boston house, housing.csv. I used Pandas to read this file and I saved the data in all data sets. So let's display the head of this file. As you see in here, we have cri crime, we have ZN, we have uh, in, uh, like other types of other parameters that you can use and the description for all of these parameters are already listed at the top of this file. Now uh, we have the median uh, uh, V which is the, the median value of the house price and again the index in here is is not in order because I already run this uh, uh, notebook or this code before 
so therefore this data that you see is not what I loaded from the file when you load it fresh freshly you'll be able to see different data that pop up in here now let's see how many rows and columns we have within our data uh, when I, I, I try to print that so we can see the shape or how many uh, data points we have to make sure and verify that our data is correct as you see in here we have 506 uh, examples 506 rows and 14 different columns which is the data set that we have then I use dot info so the data set dot info to display some statistics and some information simple information data type of my data as you see most of the data is uh, float except the uh, this variable and this these two variables are integer values which is totally fine uh, the data is not scaled so we need to scale it in a minute and we have 505 uh, examples now let's see how we can clean our data set the first step is cleaning the data set and pre-processing of the data set I would like to see if I have any null values or not available values missing values so I use dot the data set dot is a to show how many values or missing values in each column we have it looks like we do not have any missing values and our data is clean I also used uh, not available and I tried to sum it on rows so to see how many rows rows I have missing values in you may not need this one it's just for the sake of showing you how to use index and uh, the axis is in fact the axis equals 1 and the axis in here by default equals 0 so if you do not use the axis that should be fine and it should display axis equals 0 will be the, uh, the rows and axis equals uh, sorry axis equals 0 will be the columns and axis equals 1 will be the rows now I do not have any missing values let's see if we have any null values null that means nothing and it's another representation for missing values we do not have any missing values in the columns and rows again so we do not need to process it in case you have missing values I tried to add some comment in here for instance you can drop the values or delete all rows that the old rows that have missing values by saying the data set or the frame data frame that you have which is all data set that dot drop an a drop the non available data or rows or drop any rows with at least one non available entry you can also use fill not available data of uh, fill and a uh, which will fill the uh, missing values with zeros or you can set them to any numbers like the mean for instance or um, zero or you can just fill it with the mean of that column like let me just add a comment in here uh, mean of column so you can just select that column column by column and fill an a of the mean for that column and this is a good uh, strategy for uh, recovering or imputing missing values now let's see how our data set so we said our data set includes 505 data points so the 505 data points or 505 examples I would like to slice my data for instance I would like to retrieve the last in uh, examples so if my data set includes 505 examples I would like to retrieve the last 20 rows and save them within a data frame so you can go with either head or you can go with all data set and use the square brackets leave it empty and go with n and this will take the last 20 uh, rows within your data and place them within this 10 data set let's see for instance if I would like to um, I save the first example so you can just type all data set one one and so on or you can just put a range similar to how we do it if you are familiar with MATLAB but MATLAB uses uh, the parentheses and here we use a square brackets now why is this useful as you will see in the future we will ask you to go and um, uh, take part of your data for instance you have 500 data points or 505 and out of these 500 data points I would like to you to take 200 examples and train your model on these 200 examples and see how the model is performing then 
increase this sample and use 300 data points and 400 and 500 so you have three four different five different scenarios where you trained on 100 200 300 4 and 500 examples so you have five different scenarios or five different models each model uses different size of a data set so if you want to slice your data well, this is one way to slice your data and select like maybe 20 data points or uh, 100 data points and so on and this will save them within 10 data set so let's see another way of sampling our data set so now this will take if your data is sorted and that the first class at the top the second one at the bottom and so on and so forth this will eliminate any sort of variation within your training data set we want to make sure that our data set is uh, like shuffled randomly uh, organized within your data frame when you feed it to the model we wanted to make sure that the data is organized randomly or sorted randomly we do not want it to be sorted so to do that there is another method to sample your data and shuffle in fact your data if you would like to shuffle your data and reorganize it shuffle it randomly you can use the function uh, uh, sample so this sample it's a function to select randomly select a few data points from your uh, from your data frame so the data set or data frame dot sample and now I would like to sample this or select randomly a few examples from this data set then you provide as a parameter the fraction so how much would you like to subsample out of this data set how much would you like how much is the ratio that you would like to sample from this data set if you set it as one then this will shuffle your data and randomly shuffle it and randomly organize it and we'll keep all of it so one means 100 percent so this is a trick to shuffle and uh, shuffle your data and, and randomly re reorganize it now for the sake of this example I would like to take 90 percent of the uh, given or the available data set and use it for this example I will not use all of the data set so I would like to randomly select 90 percent of the data set and use it to train my model to do that I used the data frame or the data set dot sample and I provided the fraction with 0.9 that means 90 percent and I saved it in all data set underscore 90 percent a variable that I name and I displayed the shape now the shape shows um, uh, 455 455 samples or examples left out of 505 which is the 90% of uh, 505 and we have the same 14 columns I would like to emphasize in here that the labels are already part of our data set so the labels are still part of this data frame now we uh, took randomly subset of the training data set and we kept 90% of this sample as the training data set for this example now this 90% we will use it we will use this 90% to create the three splits so we will split our data into three splits the three splits will be 60% for training 20% for uh, testing and 20% will be for validation so to do that you have one of two options the first option is you you might use sample and then you select 60% of your data for training you remove what you added for training from what's left and then you select randomly from what's left 50% and whatever left will be for validation so again you sample your data set and you take 60% for training using sample or and then what's left you take your data and you exclude the training examples from the data set now what's left is the 40 percent now you divide this 40 percent into two halves one half will be for training and one half sorry one half will be for testing and one half will be for validation so now you can do that by dropping now you drop the the the, the training and what's left in here the 40 percent now you can take this and divide it into two halves each half will be uh, the 40 uh, 20 percent and to do that you will 
you will have to take the test data set and sample it. The fraction will be 50% and this will be the validation. And remove this validation and drop the validation. And then what's left will be the test portion. Or you can do it using train test split. So I've done it similarly. But this scenario what I've done is the training data set and the temp test data set which is the test data set that I will use so I decided I will make my test data set as 40% of the overall data set so now 40% will go for the test and the rest will be, will be the training so the training now is 60% so we are done with the training so that if you print the training shape you should be able to see the training are 200 data points 273 data points Whereas the temp test data set is 182 data points. So we will take these 182 and divide them into validation and testing. So this is a 100% for testing. We will divide it into validation and testing. So we use the same function, train test, and we say take the temp test, which is the 182, and divide them into 50-50, 50%. -50, 50% for test data set and 50% for validation data set which will be 182 divided by 2 it will be 91 so when we printed the shape we see now our validation is or our testing is 91 data points and our validation is 91 data points or 91 examples and training is 273 by 14 14 columns uh, validation is 91 by 14 and the testing is 91 rows by 14 columns now our data is already prepared split and we need to uh, let's see more information about it we try to print them in here just see the size or the shape of each one in here I would like to show you something because I had a few questions in the past about it so how can I tell what's the actual data type of my variable in Python? You know Python does not have a data type similar to C++. So you do not declare a variable with a predefined data type. So therefore, and, and the data type will be assigned at runtime. When I talk about data type, I mean string, integer, float, character, and so on. These are data types. So if I would like to know what's the data type of my variable or what's the type of my variable, if it's an object or anything like this, you can use the function type and then provide your variable between brackets and this will provide you with the type of that variable or object. In this example, I wanted to show you what's the data type of this test data set. As you see it in here, it shows the data type as pandas. So it's a pandas data type. So all of our so all of our data uh, variables in here the train the test and validation are of type pandas and the sizes as I mentioned I tried to print them again so we can see the sizes now let's try to plot and see how each pair of variables are correlated and if we have a high correlation or similar correlation between across variables so we can drop them reduce the complexity of our uh, data set. So again, the 14 columns in here, that means we have 13 features and one label. So we try to, to, to print the correlation or sort of uh, plot the, the, the relationship between every pair of variables within or every pair of features within our data set. So you can do that using a for loop and then plot the x axis is the first variable and the y axis is the second variable. Or you can use the function there is a function that comes from SNS, which is the uh, Seaborn. And this function is called pair plot. So what we have done in here, we went to the train statistics or we went to training data set and we would like to remove the label. So we took the train stats and we created a copy of our training data set, a copy of the statistics. And then we removed, so this line, will remove the label from the uh, the data set. So train stats will remove the the, the uh, label from the data set. So we have the, the this temporary object contains the data set without the class 
label. Now we use the pair plot and we provided the chain stat, which is the temporary variable that we created in here with dot columns. And feel free to print this variable to see what the contents are. And then we decided we will use diag kind as KDE. You can use it as regression or any other types of correlation that connects the variables together. So this might, this uh, like to print this plot might take like uh, 30 seconds, 45 seconds to plot it, which is totally fine. I have it in here already drawn and you should be able to see the relationship between every two variables. So let's see a sample. So you can see in here, for instance, this is this variable and the crime, and this is the relationship between them in the training data set. So you can see the data is condensed in here and so on. So you can study it and it's out of this class of scope to go into the details of statistics and what's the relationship between every two variables and what we can read out of that. Feel free to go to any stat, intro to stat course, intro, introduction to statistics and you should be able to find more details about the variables and the correlations between the variables. Now, uh, in, the, in the next example also, we try to print the description and see what we mean by this description. So it's the same statistics. We, d we, we, we added the describe and let's see what the statistics are or how does the stat looks like. So you see in here we have all of our variables. We have the count, we have the mean, standard deviation, minimum. We have uh, the tw top 25 percentile, 50 percentile, 75 percentile, the maximum value and so on. And this is in fact the data set that we have. This is the data set description. We removed the label and then we transposed it so we can see the, the rows as uh, the variables and the columns are the descriptions. And then we printed this stat just to have a general intro uh, like read of the data. And as you can see, the mean is wide. So the, this example or the age in here, the um, mean is 69 and the standard deviation is, is 27. So the data is is uh, in, in a wide range so, so we may have to go and try to pre-process it uh, if we look in here at the minimum value is 2.9 and the maximum is 100 the 25 percentile is 46 and then above that uh, the, the 50 percentile uh, is 76 and the 75 percentile is 94 so the data requires some sort of pre-processing so we'll go and see how we can process it but before we pre-process the data, let's exclude or split have the label in one variable and the uh, data set itself in a second variable. So now we have three data sets, train, test, and validation. We will create three variables for the labels for each uh, split labels, and then we will save them. Now after you split and exclude or save the labels in a different data in a different variable make sure that you do not change the order of your rows in either the, the, the labels or the data set itself because now you want it to make sure that they are parallel and they are the, like the, the label matches the example now we use the pop function so the pop function from pandas it will remove the uh, column that you provide or the list of columns and then it will return them so now we remove the label and we assigned it to the object train labels and we have done the same for the rest of the variables so this again this line will delete the column mid uh, v where it delete it from train data set and return it so therefore it will be saved in train labels so after I execute this line the train labels will co contain the mid V uh, column and the train data set will include 13 columns and it will not have the v the, the the label anymore within the data set so I've done the same for the test and validation so we can feed the model with the data separate from the labels now let's see the data normalization and scaling. You know I like to go with uh, subtracting the mean and dividing by standard deviation. So at this time I created a simple function. I called it normalization or norm. This function will take X as training data set or uh, like the data set. It might be train, validation or testing. 
then it, 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 the, this function will take the, every data point in the training data set and or testing data set or the validation data set and subtract it from the chain data set mean and then divide it by the standard deviation. So this statistics or this mean and standard deviation they are always for the training data set and the training data set is global now and it will be always like uh, we will use the parameters from the training data set to normalize both or all of the training data set, testing data set and validation. And we already talked about that in previous videos. Now, I will call this function to call uh, to declare a function in Python. You use the keyword def, that stands for define, then the function name, and you provide the list of parameters. You add colon to indicate this is the, the beginning of the, fu the, the, the the beginning of the function implementation, and then you maintain an indentation to indicate this is the block of this function. This function is very simple. It just includes one line subtracting the mean and dividing by a standard deviation for that variable. Now we call the function, we normalized our data and the data is now normalized. Let's look at it and see how it looks. I printed the, all of the splits with their shapes and the labels with the shapes. So as you see in here, the test, train and validation, they have the same number of data points or the same number of examples, but the number of Columns is different. It's one less than the previous or previously what you we used to see. It's 13 now. And the labels are just one column, as you see it in here, which is exactly what we are looking for. Let's look at our data after we normalize it. And as you see in here, I try to maintain and retain the previous value. So train data set, I did not overwrite train data set. So train data set still saved. I created a new variable. I added normed, stand for normalized, short for normalized, train data set, normed, test data set, normed, valid data set, just for short for normalized, train and test and validation. And I did not change the original variables. In case I need to go and rerun it again, this will save me some time. So now the data set is already saved and let's see the data set after it's scaled. You see the data points are Ma now normalized. They look like between minus one and one or even like centralized around zero. So you see this value is above one. So it might be like between uh, like minus two up to minus two or minus uh, three up to three, something like this. So you can find that in fact by looking at the maximum value of each column. Now let's build our neural network. So in this neural network, what I will do in this model, I will build, build a model. In this model, we will have an input layer. This input layer will accept our features. We have 13 features. And then it will have number of neurons. I will refer to the neurons or number of neurons as units or the output. So the number of neurons will match the number of output, the number of the output from that layer. Now, for simplicity, I declare the function, and this function uses def, function name, and then I do not pass any parameters in here, and the colon, and this will indicate this is my function. Now, to uh, this is my function to create my model. So all of what I need to do is just call this function to create the model. Now, we would like to create the model and we would like to name it as model. Just name it whatever you want and then we would like to construct the backbone for our model. Remember that at the top when we imported sequential from Keras, we call this the backbone or the empty container that we will place our model components or our model uh, layers into. So we created this container. Now, after this step, the model is constructed but still empty. It does not have any layers. Now we would like to start adding components to the model. So the first layer, which is the input layer, and the last layer, they are tricky within our model. So this model, we will construct a model with two hidden layers. So it will have two hidden layers, one input, and one output. In fact, it will have four layers, two hidden layers, one input, one output. 
So let's pay attention to how we are constructing or creating the um, the hidden. Uh, sorry, uh, how we are constructing and creating the uh, input layer. So to add a layer or any component to the model, we will use the model dot add. So model dot add will add a component to the model. Then we provide the component that we would like to add between these parentheses. Now again, as I said. For the sake of this uh, class and this video, we will use a simple type of layer, which is the dense layer. You will hear it as, or you will see it in the literature as dense layer. Some people will call it fully connected layer. Some others will call it linear layer. It's exactly the same layer that we have seen in the class. So this layer will have an input that comes from every single unit from the previous layer and it will provide output that goes as an input to every single following unit in the next layer. This is why it's called dense, because it's densely connected. Each unit will be connected to every other unit in the following layer. So this is a dense layer, and this is the input layer. In the input layer, you must specify the, the input shape. So the input shape in our scenario, you can simply write it as 13 and just delete the highlighted part so this is the part just delete it or sorry not this part in fact you need to provide delete this and just type 13 and keep this comma this comma it has a reason in tensorflow so and that's it or you can make it as general as possible as I've done it in here so if you modify your data, data set you do not need to go and change the input uh, the, the input layer uh, so therefore what I, I've done I used the training data set I retrieved the shape and I, the shape will have 0 and 1 0 will be the number of rows and 1 will be the number of columns and remember we have 13 columns which is exactly the number of features that we have so therefore this uh, this expression will be evaluated to 13 or to the number of features within our data set the number of columns now input shape equals and you provide the size of your or the input size or the number of features within your data set then you provide how many hidden units or how many neurons you have within this layer so in, in my case I'm using exactly 10 hidden or 10 units within this layer the input layer now this one or this layer has been constructed now the next layer we will have we will add a second layer so this is the first hidden layer hidden layer one we will use model dot add then we will provide dense how many neurons you would like to use you can use 50 64 uh, 128 or 100 or 512 or whatever number you like to have it depends on how you optimize your or how what you decide the architecture of your model will be and then what would you like the activation function to be remember the activation function that we described in the class we said you can use sigmoid so these are the list of possible activations that you can use you can use sigmoid you can use softmax tan h relu and Re leaky relu i will go with either relu or sigmoid both will have similar results so sigmoid is the non-linear function or regular or the activation function I added a second layer similarly I use dense the number of neurons and the activation that I would like to use now we have input layer this is the input layer with number of neurons and the shape we have a model and we have uh, sorry the first hidden layer and the second hidden layer so now one thing in here I would like to add you can add the activation as a separate line if you would like to or you can just keep it as I've done it in here within one line you add the, 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 the number of neurons and the activation at, at the same line finally our output would be one single value which is the regression value which is the value that we have or the expected value for the house price and since we expect a continuous value so this is uh, this will be a continuous or one output so this is the output and it will be one of dimension one one neuron that provides us with the output 
the activation can be sigmoid, softmax, 10H as I said, or any of these uh, activations. So we have the optimizer. The optimization function that we will use to calculate our weights or our parameters to evaluate and calculate the error. So you can use gradient descent. We talked about gradient descent. So this is a flavor, one flavor of gradient descent is called stochastic gradient descent. And there are other types of or other uh, optimizers that you can use. I listed the reference for where you can find more information about these optimizers. For the sake of this tutorial, I'll be using uh, root mean squared prob, prob, RMS prob. And then, so this is the optimizer. You can replace it with stochastic gradient descent and that's it, or any of the other optimizers. And then provide the learning rate. So as you see in here, I'm using a fairly low learning rate. It's 0 0.001. Now, so far, we constructed our model, two hidden layers, input and output layers as well, so four layers. And we have the learning rate is already all set. We decided what optimizer we will use, what activation functions we will use with each layer and now we would like to go and proceed and create our model compile our model to compile the model we will use model.compile and then we will see what's the loss function what's the function that you will use to compare the uh, output of your model the hypothesis you compare it with the actual labels with y so you remember how we tried to compare the two values the ground truth the actual labels y values against the uh, against the output of our model or the output of our hypothesis so we call the function that compares these two values as a loss function so the loss function in, in our scenario in here for regression, it's commonly used as the mean squared error. So we'll use the loss function as a mean squared error. And then the optimizer will be the optimizer that we constructed in here. And then metrics to, to, to see how we are performing during training. So the metrics can you can uh, use any type of metrics, but the commonly used ones for regression are mean absolute error or mean squared error or maybe mean absolute error percentage mean absolute error percentage mean squared error and mean absolute error there are three different measures for uh, the accuracy or how the model is performing you can use any of them or I just listed you can use one of them but I listed three of them just to show you that you can use multiple ones you feel free to go to TensorFlow's website and you should be able to see what other metrics you can use. At the end, after the model will be compiled, we will return the model. So, so far the model will be initialized, will be constructed, the weights will be random values, and it's ready to be trained. So this is function one. Let's see another model. So now let's, let's try to call this model. So I call the model build model one underscore two underscore hidden layers. So this will call the function and do not forget these parentheses and save it in a variable. It happened to be model in here as well. So now the model is already compiled and it will be saved in model. I would like to see how the model or more information about the model after it's constructed and I want to make sure that's constructed successfully. So I used model dot summary. And model.summary will show you a summary of your model. Your model is sequential, doesn't have any branches, doesn't have anything uh, abnormal or something uh, different than uh, sequential. It includes, this is the input layer, it's of type dense, it's a, a fully connected layer. It does have 10 neurons and we have 140 parameters within this layer. The second layer, it's a dense, it has 50, 50 uh, neurons and it has 550 parameters. This is the third layer and this is the fourth layer because we start from zero. The input layer will take number zero. Now we have four layers, two of them are hidden and the output layer, remember, it has one output. 
So now, the total number of parameters for this model, it's very small, it's 3,291, 3,291 parameters. The trainable parameters are the same as the total number of parameters because you might have parameters that you will not train and non-trainable parameters are zero. Let's try to complicate it a little bit more. It's not complication, but we would like to increase the number of hidden layers. So we created model three or model two. Model two includes three hidden layers. So similarly, we started with a sequential uh, to have the backbone of the model. And then we added the dense layer as the input layer. And instead of having 10 hidden units in the input layer, we just decided to make them 32. We would like to evaluate a different set of parameters. Then the input shape will be similar, which is the number of features. I added three hidden layers. The first hidden layer, it was 32. Then I multiplied the 32 by two. It gave me 64 that I used as uh, a size for the next hidden layer or the number of hidden units within this or the number of units within the, the second hidden layer. The last hidden layer, I decided to use double the previous layer's neurons. So therefore, I used 128 neurons or 128 uh, units. So this is valid as well, or you can use them the same size as in the previous case or the previous model. Now we have five different layers, uh, two hidden layers and th uh, sorry, two, one input and one output and three hidden layers. In the learning rate, I decided to increase it and I'm using 0.01. I use the same, uh, let's try to use SGD in here. And I used mean squared error and other uh, metrics to measure the how we are performing. Now, when we try to print the model, so I call the model in the same cell, I constructed the model and I printed the summary. You can see now we have uh, input layer, then we have dense layer one, dense layer, dense layer, and so on. So we have a few dense layers in here. And don't worry about the numbering, the sequential or the numbering in here. This has something to do with, with Kiras and the model that we created before. Now, I increased both the number of neurons within each hidden layer as well as the depth or the number of hidden layers and you see that increased the number of trainable parameters it's now 12,000 instead of 3,000 in the previous uh, model let's expand it even more and create five hidden layers so this model will have seven layers in total we will have one input layer five hidden layers and one output layer now let's compile it we use the same learning rate or like 0 0.001 learning rate. We use the same optimizer, the same loss and metrics to measure how the model is performing. Remember, so far we have not used our training data set. We constructed the model. We printed the summary of the model. As you see, it's, it's continuous from the previous number. And now we would like to see a uh, uh, number of parameters. We have 19,000 parameters. Why it's a little bit less than the previous model? Because the previous model has much more number of hidden units. Uh, sorry, number of units in, in, in the last layer, which it, it, it created a lot of variables. Now, let's try to take the model, model one, or the model that we created, and which is model one, which includes uh, uh, two hidden layers, one input, and one output. The model is already initialized to random weights and let's assume or use it to predict just initially pass an example to this uh, model and see how it performs. We have not trained it. We are just using the random weights that have been initialized or assigned to the model when it was constructed. So we extracted 10 examples, just take 10 data points, we called it example batch and this is the slicing that I talked about early in this video then we we took the model and we used dot predict so dot predict from the name it will try to predict the labels for the given examples now I save the results and example results 
and display the results. So you see, you see now the values are just a bunch of random values. Now let's see what are the actual labels for this data, uh, these data points. I think I displayed them somewhere in here. Okay, if, if they're not in here, uh, yeah, so I did not display them in, in this example. So the actual labels are totally different than these values. Now, before I start training the model, let's look how we can save the model while training. So what I will do in here, I will try to save the model. If I will train the model, my model, remember that we take all of our data set and then we pass it through our uh, model in the forward propagation and then we pass it in the backward propagation, back propagation. And this one time where we pass all of our data once back and forth, we call it epoch. The epoch, the e epoch means, means you pass all of your data set to the, uh, with a new model one time. So you train your model for one epoch. So after each epoch, we update the weights. So therefore, after each epoch, we have updated model. So if I decided to train my model five or ten different epochs, ten different epochs, so after each epoch, we will have a different model. So I might end up with having the best model at epoch seven. At epoch seven, I have good convergence. Uh, I uh, like my model was in a local optima. It was performing perfect. An iteration or an, an epoch, uh, an epoch eight and nine, it it went out of that local minima and I it it did not produce good results. So therefore, we would like to pick the model during this training that performs the best. It does not have to be the last model. So now what we are doing, we are trying to select and tell Kiras to select the model with the best performance during the training. How can I select the, the model with the best performance? Remember that we used the validation data set to determine which model is performing the best and then save it. So Kiras have this feature where it can save it for us automatically. Any model that performs well, it will be saved automatically and it will be the last uh, or the model that will be saved at the end of the training. Now, we declared a variable that's called checkpoint and this checkpoint path is the place where I would like to save my model results. We decided to save it within a folder that's called models. You can save it somewhere else if you would like to, but I would like to save it within the same directory in a folder called models and house prediction.ckpt. So CK stands for check PT point, checkpoint. Just name it whatever you want, any extension name that you feel comfortable with. Dot slash, that means this is the current directory. If you are using characters like this slash and this slash, make sure you add this R at the beginning of your string. This is in Python. Now, uh, we decided this is the location where we will save our uh, uh, where we will save our model during training or the best model and then we declared what's called callbacks so this callback it means it's a function that will be called at the end of every epoch so I called tf.kiras.callbacks the callback in here will be model checkpoint at the end of each model we will have a checkpoint where would you like to save it file path equals the checkpoint path, which is this checkpoint path that we, we, we decided to use. So this is the location on your hard disk drive. What would you like to use to, to make sure or save the best model? We are using the validation loss, the validation loss as a measure or metric to identify this model is better than this. You can replace it with val accuracy. Accuracy will work if you have a model that's predicting like uh, classification problem not regression for regression we will go with validation loss would you like to save all of the models or the best model only we would like to save just the best model only because the, the, in this example we have 3000 parameters it's fairly small but if you have 5 million parameters your model will be 3-4 gig of, uh, on, of a file so we would like just to save the best model 
you would you like to save the weights only or save the weights as well as the structure of your file so I would like just to save the weights just say true verbose which is would you like to print something about uh, uh, when you save the model we can just set it to zero or, or one so this uh, verbose you can see it uh, when you train the model if you set it to one let's train our model so I decided to add a time so I can measure the time for training this model and how many times or how many times would you like to pass all of your data through the model how many times do you want to apply your model or uh, update the weights of your model so we decided to go with number of epochs equals 500 we will go feed our data 500 times so now uh, this is something I, I would like to mention in here just for the sake of training these models now if you do not have enough memory uh, you will not be able to feed all of your data all together at once so neural network have the ability of taking the data in small chunks for instance you can desire take your data we have 300 data points in the train in the uh, training data set so you can divide this data set into batches or uh, batches in fact of uh, like maybe 30 or 32 or 10 data points at a time so it will feed all of the data uh, in batches of 10 or 32 in this example 32 examples at once 30 then the next 32 the next 32 and so on and so forth until it's done once we feed all of the data the first epoch is done and then it will take again the data data all of the data divide it into chunks and feed it again and again until you are done with the 500 epochs so this is called mini batch size mini batch size or batch size so I will use 32 um, you can use other numbers and this is in fact a parameter that you need to tune and find out just use the validation data set to see what would be the best batch size or mini batch size I found that mini batch size of 24 10 uh, sometimes if the data set is small similar to our data 32 would be good enough 24 will be fine if your data set is larger like maybe you have uh, uh, 50,000 data points you can increase this uh, this mini batch size to, th to, um, to be for instance 128 128 might be too much but you can go with 32 and and 64 at most 100 128 then we constructed our model so these are two hyperparameters that you need to tune the epochs number of epochs and the batch size you, you need to use the validation data to experiment with them and then plot your learning model your learning curve and see how you are learning after that I decided to plot the model summary so I can see the summary of the model before I start training and this is the training of the model so to train your model what we will do in here you can do one of two things if you have a GPU you can select which which GPU or you have multiple GPUs if you have one GPU you can just keep this one GPU 0 if you have two GPUs and you would like to use the second one you can just say GPU 1 and so on uncomment this line and comment this line if you would like to use a GPU otherwise if you'd like to use a CPU just keep it as is we say with TensorFlow devices use CPU 0 and do the following so this line or this command that's highlighted in here will train your model will fit the training data set on a model so what we have done in here we said just take the model that we constructed in here in the function build model 2 with the three hidden layers and fit it on the data set when you fit it let's see what parameters we need to add so we need to use the normalized training data set as our training data set to fit the model we would like to use the train labels the labels for this training data set as labels for this data we would like to use a batch size or a mini batch size of 32 so I use batch size this is the second batch size in here is this batch size and I highly encourage you to test and evaluate rerun this example with multiple batch or mini batch sizes 
Epochs. How many times would you like to feed your data at once? So we would like to go 500 times. That might be a very high number, but let's just keep it as 500 because our data set is small. Verbus is what would you like to display while training the model? Would you like to see a lot of details? So you can set it to 0, 1, or 2. At the end of each epoch, once you train all of your data, would you like to shuffle your data randomly, uh, uh, mix the data, and reconstruct a new set of mini batch sizes, uh, mini batches? I said yes, and this is a good practice. Make sure it's set to yes, or true, sorry. Steps per epoch. So how many steps do you have per epoch? So this, in fact, will be the the size of your data, how many examples you have, divided by the mini batch size. If I have 300 data points or 300 examples, we decided we would like to have every mini batch of size 50. So 50, so 300 divided by 50, this will provide us with six different uh, 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 steps, or we call them iterations. So this will provide us with how many steps we would like to go with. Now, this will be the validation. Validation data, remember that we created the validation, normalized validation, and the labels for the validation data set. We provided them in a form of a tuple. Then, we would like to save our data at the end of each, uh, uh, at the end of each epoch. We would like to save our model if it's good. Otherwise, we will proceed to the next one. So we have this callbacks. And this callbacks, I provided two things. The first one is just to show a neat printing when you uh, train your model. So please feel free to remove this highlighted or selected text and run the model and see how the model out training output will look like. And put it one time and run it. See how it looks like with and without it. It's just for formatting thing. And checkpoint callback is Remember the function that we, or the, the callback function we created in here, is just to save the best model using the validation loss. Now, once we run this one, the model will start uh, training. So this is the, the, the model, this is the uh, parameters of the model that I, I printed in here, which is a summary of the model, and the training will come next. So you see in here, the model started at epoch 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 100, so it's displaying in here hundreds a time. This is because I used this line. Otherwise, it will show you the output of each after each epoch. So, for instance, after epoch 100, we had the loss function or the loss function value as 7.4. The mean absolute error was 2.1. MAPE is 10.7. Mean squared error is 7.4. So these values are calculated for the training data set. Now, if you would like to see how the validation is calculated or the data on the calculation at the same epoch, the validation loss, we fit the validation data set once within our model and we calculated the, value, the loss. It was 27. The mean absolute error was 3. The uh, MAPE for the validation was 16. And the MSE, mean squared error, for the validation was 27. So you will be able to see that after each epoch. Or after, in this scenario, because I would like to see it after 100, each 100 epoch, you can see it in here. Now I would like to mention something else in here. I assigned the model train to a variable, and I named that variable as history. So now, I should be able to come back to the history and do some analysis on this history. So now we trained our model, remember that we saved the time, and training this model on my personal computer in here, it took me 22 seconds, 22.5 seconds to train this model. CPU time, uh, CPU time, so the user time was 22.3, system time was 1.7, and the total time was 24 seconds, the wall time was 22.5 seconds. Let's see some summary about the history. So we took the history, dot history, and we converted it to pandas data frame. We saved it in a variable that's called hist. And then we used the epoch number as an indication or as an index for 
our we took it from the index and we added it as a column within our uh, within our history or log results then we displayed history tail so we'd like to see how we are performing toward the end of the training so as you see in this table we have at epoch 2 for 99 almost the last epoch our loss was 2.0 mean absolute error was 1 mean square error these are for the training and these are for the validation let me go back a little bit and show you something now if you look at the loss the loss value for the training that it started at 205 that it went down to 7 after 100 epochs after 200 epochs it went to 600 after uh, to 6 after 300 epochs to 5 and after 400 to 1 point something so you see in here the loss value is decreasing uh, similar to the mean absolute error and other values which is a good sign that our model is learning and our model is healthy because the loss is decreasing and it should be decreasing this is the error the error is decreasing that means the model is learning from our data now let's look at the validation the validation will give us another indication the validation loss we started 46 then we went to 27, 47, 35, and 58. That means the model is not learning. The validation is, in, the loss is increasing, and therefore this is an indication that our model is overfitting. It's overfitting the training data set. It's doing good on the training data set, but it's doing very bad on the validation data set. So the model is overfitting because the number of examples is very small okay so summary of the results this is a summary you can display it for all of the 500 examples but that would be useless let's try to plot it and see how it, it will look like when we plot it so before I go and plot it I would like to see the prediction results for for instance the 10 data points from the training data set 10 data points from the validation and 10 data points from the testing so we have done that for the uh, 10 data points from the training data set and you see in here these are the predicted values and these are the actual values so you see this is 24 this is 25 22 23 and 22 uh, 16 and 17 35 and 34 so they are very close that means the mean error or what we have seen as an the error or the loss is low that makes sense so we expect our model is performing well and this is the training data set let's go and see it on the testing data set I think I displayed it somewhere in here for the testing data set if it's not in here so what we can do we can just uh, let me just show you for the testing data set so this is our uh, training data set let me just, I, I do not want to make a mistake in the name of the, and this is the validation, and this is the testing data set, variable name. I'll just copy the variable name and change it in here. So now I have the test data set, the examples, and I will predict, use the model to predict and see the results. So the results now, and, and this one is part of this. okay so this is uh, the uh, the first 10 data points or 10 data points from the training data set so the ground truth for them is in here and uh, this is the training data set the testing data set 10 data points let's see the ground truth we do not have the ground truth so let's see it so train labels chain labels uh, it's it's in in this scenario it's test labels and now this is 24 29 this is 23 27 this is 22 22 19 and 12 so you see they are a little bit different so therefore now in the testing data set we are not as close as it was in the training data set which is another indication that we are our models overfitting okay see how the training went by plotting the loss and mean squared error across epochs so I created plotter and the plotter will be just the history that came from uh, uh, like that that was generated when I trained the model 
So it's TensorFlow Docs, which is the library, one of the libraries I installed, one of the packages, and we would like to plot it for the uh, the, the variables that we have seen, or the the uh, the history of the training that we have uh, trained a few minutes ago. So we used plotter, which is the same object that we created before, plot, and we would like to plot the basics from the history, and this function will find the basics of the history that correspond to mean squared error, mean absolute error, sorry, and then plot them. And then plot dot uh, y limit, so the y limit will be from 0 to 10, I think that's too much, we can just make it from 0 to 8. And y label will be the mean absolute error, so this is the mean absolute error, and the x-axis is the number of epochs. So we can plot it now, and you see that we just uh, showed it between, so this is smaller, if you go bigger, it's not as clear as when we use 8. So now, this is the mean absolute error for our data, for the history, and you can see in here, this is the training loss, is healthy and is learning well, however the validation, which is the, 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 the dotted or dashed line, is not learning as we are expecting. Let's see the mean squared error. Mean squared error will show similar results, as you see it in here, but the difference between mean squared error and mean absolute error, one of them is uh, like will produce smaller values. Now we will start from 200 might be too much so let's start from 125 yeah so this make more sense maybe from 80 up to 80 okay so this is the loss function it's learning as I said the training is learning but the validation is volatile and it's not decreasing so we expect to see it with a behavior similar to the training uh, loss behavior, maybe higher a little bit, but not with this pattern. Now, let's see the mean squared error and other measures for the training data set. So, I will take the training data set with its labels and then take the model that I trained and use the evaluate function. Evaluate function will perform similar to predict. Predict will give you the label, the actual labels or the labels that the predicted labels whereas evaluate will just provide you with the error rate so model dot evaluate on the training data set we said the loss the mean absolute error mean square error and the map mean absolute percentage error and let's try to print maybe mean absolute error and mean squared error out for the training data set so you see that the, the mean uh, the mean absolute error is 0.75 and the mean squared error is 1.13 for the training data set, which is perfect. Let's see it for the validation data set. Now it's much higher for the validation data set. You see it's 3.11 and 30.72, which is fairly high. Let's see it for the uh, testing data set. I expect they will be close to the validation. If they are very close. Uh, except that the mean squared error is a bit uh, less which is fine and expected because our testing data set is very small so having 90 data points as a validation and 94 testing is a very small uh, number of data points especially for neural network so we have it 17 and 2 fairly close unlike uh, 1.13 uh, and 0.75 again the, the model is overfitting because of small data set. Now let's run the prediction and try to uh, create a scatter plot where we have the true value, the actual value, and the predicted values and try to see are we able to uh, uh, like ideally if our model is perfect so we'll see all of these dots on the same line. Okay so the test of prediction now or predictions we will feed our testing data set and then predict it and flatten it to be one dimensional array and then create a plot, name it A this plot will be a scatter plot that plot the test labels versus the test predictions then the x-axis will be the true values and the y-axis will be the predicted values 
the limits for the x-axis uh, the limits will be from 0 to 50 for both so we can see it in here now it's uh, from if, if you want to be more accurate you can go with the minimum of both the test and uh, and uh, the test labels and the test predictions and the maximum for both of them and, and place it in here I don't think we have more than 50 let's see 100 yeah so uh, sorry 100 not 50 not 10 so you see we have around like maybe we can, can go with 60 let's just make the limit as 60 okay so all of our data points are included the limit is, is this one from 0 to 60 and from 0 to 60 and now we would like to plot the limits or limbs that we created on the plot itself and this is the relationship between the true values and the predicted values again we should ideally we will see them on the same line if we would like to see how the model fits on the training data sets this would be interesting to see uh, so this is the testing data set let's go with train instead of test oh sorry so we need to go instead of uh, test we'll go with train in here because the number does not match and let's make this one train okay so you see now the training data set fits perfectly whereas this is the uh, test data set does not fit as good as the training data set uh, let's see the scatter plot where our error is is centered so our error is centered around between 0 to 5 and minus 5 so this is the error prediction error a, sm a small portion of our error is uh, very low into the minus 25 and some is in the 20 so we would like to see ideally we will see most of the errors around the 0 closer to 0 if they are expanded that means the difference between the uh, actual levels and the predicted levels is very far and this is in fact a fairly good uh, error rate uh, however it's still again I, I see like these data points and this data points are still maybe just distor uh, like uh, adding noise to the classifier again that's because of small data set let's see how we can save our weights I added the tutorial about how to save it in Keras from Google you should be able to see it as well similar to what I will explain in here so you can save the weights or you can save the actual uh, data points uh, it looks like I have an error in here okay yeah because I do not have build model I changed the name and we call the model build uh, let's see one of the models that we created in here so in fact I'm trying to get into build model 3 hidden layers so what we have done in here I'm trying just to simulate as if uh, we will save the weights the model is already created we will save the weights and this will save the values only now after I save the, the weights so we have uh, I think I have MAPE as well okay now this is save, save the model now model.save weights will save our weights in, at this checkpoint now once I save it I can go to a different computer and load it and use it so I do not need to change every time I need to use it now to create the model so you can load it so you need to create the wires you create the layers then do you load the weights layers are different than the weights the weights are the actual values layers are the description of each value how many neurons you have in each value in each uh, layer and the number of layers now to restore the, the weights after they are saved you can use model the model that you created in here dot load weights and load the weights in here so you will not find these three sentences together you will find this sentence to save it you will use this line to save your model then later on somewhere else you will be using these two lines to load your weight and maybe use it for prediction or evaluation so in here we try to use it for evaluating the model try to rerun this code again and see what results you will have uh, make sure you install all of the packages before the code will be uploaded uh, with this example thank you